This is SOS Central America. I'm Maria Martin reporting. I remember a conversation with my grandfather. Close of the time he died, he told me, you must change your profession. I don't recommend you journalism. Guatemala's best-known journalist, Jose Ruben Zamora, of the muckraking newspaper El Periódico, has been in prison now for almost a year. Decimos no al poder, se leyó en la última portada del diario El Periódico, que cerró su edición digital después de seis meses de su última edición impresa y diez meses del arresto de su director, José Rubén Zamora. Imagine waking up one morning and there's no New York Times or that the Washington Post had been forced by its enemies to close, that the home of the head of those papers had been invaded by security forces and taken to prison and is now being judged by a system that appears unwilling to give him a fair trial. That's what's happening in Guatemala, a deeply unequal society and one of the Central American countries now seeing a reversal in democracy and the rule of law and a takeover by corrupt and authoritarian forces. I think that this has been a very unfair trial for Jose Rubén Zamora, who has been denied of his right to defend himself. The story of what's happening to one man who spent most of his life trying to change the system by telling the truth may give us a clue as to why so many people are leaving a society that for many seems to be going back into a dark past. Veteran journalist Juan Luis Font worked with José Rubén Zamora for many years, and he's seen it all. Listen, I have been working as a journalist for the last 33 years, and I have seen many things happen along these years. To start with, when I got into journalism, we were just coming out from a war And we had 29 Guatemalan journalists killed during the war. Then we started up with this democratic process. And it all evolved into a very corruptive and and very perverse political system. And now we come with this crush against journalism and freedom of speech. It's like this is not new for us. It's like we're living in cycles. One example of that, says Font, is the judicial process against his colleague José Rubén Zamora. Font himself was forced to leave Guatemala to avoid legal charges. He's now in exile, observing Zamora's trial on the Internet. This has been a show, the worst show of the biggest effort from the status quo in Guatemala to crush a journalist and a person who has been a pain in the heart for most of them because he has been consistently exposing their wrongdoings and and their corruption. I'm just going to mention that seven different lawyers have left his defense. Four of them have been accused by the attorney general's office I started covering the trial almost from the beginning because I I missed it. Investigative journalist Julie Lopez has been covering the legal proceedings in which Jose Ruben Zamora is charged with blackmail, influence peddling, and money laundering. It's a very convoluted case, but I guess if we want to simplify it, the, the explanation is this. There were several companies and, and business people who were supporting Zamora, but they didn't want to be identified publicly as financiers or or, uh, clients of El Periódico because of the political pressure and how the newspaper or El Periódico wasn't wasn't among the favorites of of the government due to the different publications of corruption and, and what have you. You know, normally they would give, like with any other media outlet, they would give out a check for so much money for publicity or a donation or whatever. But because they didn't want to leave a paper trail and be identified as financiers of the newspaper, they would give him cash. Being supporters of the newspaper in Guatemala in the last few years, maybe for much longer than that, is a risky business. Well, basically 20 years. I mean, an account of events by Zamora himself and one of his sons 
mentions that this has been going on for at least 20 years. I mean, I mean, the pressure on businesses that wanted to publish ads in the paper or people who wanted to donate money to the paper. And uh, as a matter of fact, when the paper closed its print edition last year in November and remained only as an online paper, one of the sons of Zamora said that they were still facing pressures like people who were who wanted to openly support the newspaper by publishing ads in in the publication were being pressured by the government. So the little support they still had last year became even scarcer because of that pressure. Zamora asked a longtime associate at a bank to deposit the equivalent of $40,000 he'd received from supporters. It happened that Ronald Garcia Navarijo had been charged with corruption and was in contact with the public ministry. He's now Jose Ruben Zamora's principal accuser. This person turned around, handed the money to the prosecution, and accused Zamora of money laundering. His exact words were, I have the suspicion that this money may come from an illicit source, but he hasn't produced any evidence to support that. Over the last three decades, José Rubén Zamora's newspaper, El Periódico, had published hundreds of in-depth investigations. Its muckraking reporting helped to bring down presidents and other powerful corrupt actors. For this, Zamora made many enemies and paid a high price. It was like eight in the morning. I was still at home and my father was still there. And then... This testimony from Zamora's eldest son, Jose Carlos Zamora, is from a documentary I produced some 20 years ago in which the young Zamora describes an incident that happened a few years after peace accords had ended 36 years of a bloody conflict that left over 200,000 Guatemalans dead, including many journalists. Zamora recalled a morning when dozens of armed men invaded their home. And then there were like 15 armed uh, men and they ran into our house and they were very violent and they tied us up and they kept threatening us, saying all these awful things. And then they put my father on, on his knees in front of us and they put a gun to his head and and they told him that they were going to kill him. At first we thought we were... Me pidieron que me quitara la ropa, me desnudaron. Yo, yo pensé que me iban a matar. Mis hijos pensaron que me iban a matar. Les pedí que me ejecutaran en el garage de la casa. Eh, ellos no quisieron y me dispararon ahí de dos veces. Eh, In his account of the attack, José Carlos' father, José Rubén Zamora, eh, desnudo, tells ¿verdad? how the attackers eh, made him disrobe, how he pleaded with them that if they were going to kill him, familia, not to do it in front of his children. Three times uh, they told me that they were going to execute me and they, they shot and I thought I was going to die. A few months before the attack, Zamora had published a series of investigative articles documenting corruption, smuggling and drug running by members and former members of the military and officials close to then-President Alfonso Portillo. Me dijeron que dejara de estar jodiendo a los de arriba, que fuera más respetuoso, Que no a al a los, eh, they told me a, to a, stop a, a, messing with those in que, power, si to no be more respectful, nada, not que, to bother que, the president or si the no authorities, nada, ellos, eh, and that if no I shut up, they would leave me alone. Que, but if I ejemplo, said something, pequeño, dijeron, they knew where my young son went to school, and they would kill me or him. Hombres armados intimidan a periodista José Rubén Zamora y su familia. Condenan unánime ataque contra presidente del periódico. At that time, José Rubén Zamora was released. But his family went into exile and the attacks never stopped. On other occasions, he's been beaten and kidnapped, had his paper audited many times, and had some 200 legal actions brought against him. And while his determination to continue publishing hard-hitting investigations has been an inspiration for many, 
his imprisonment almost a year ago has had a chilling effect on the country's press. El Periódico's once bustling newsroom is now silent. With Zamora in prison, the paper was first forced to lay off some 80% of its staff, then stop its print edition, and finally, in mid-May, the political and economic pressure got to be too much, and the paper shut down. Now, for the foreseeable future, there'll be no more of the groundbreaking investigations for which the paper had been known for nearly three decades. Here in my hands, I have uh, the main um, work that we publish uh, in uh, the time of Portillo. Uh, of course, Zamora shows us the three-page spread published in the year 2002. This is what he believes provoked the attacks against him. Named and pictured are members and former members of the military and close associates of then-President Alfonso Portillo. The article details what Zamora says amounts to a criminal mafia who have held parallel power with the government for more than 20 years. Here we are talking uh, the, the relationship between the mafia, the crime, and the army, how they control uh, and they have a, a very strong networks in all the institutions of the state. Zamora believes these were the people behind the assault on him and his family. I find that a, a very plausible hypothesis. John Hamilton was the then U.S. ambassador to Guatemala. The influence of organized crime and clandestine groups, which certainly overlap but are not necessarily one and the same, are a real threat to democracy. And it's only become worse in recent years. APG van 350 ataques en este gobierno. Un total de 66 agresiones y limitaciones de distinta índole. The Guatemalan Journalist Association has documented over 350 attacks against individual reporters and the press in general since President Alejandro Chamate took office in January of 2020. Limitaciones e irrespeto a la libertad de expresión. Meanwhile, the ties between organized crime, other groups of so-called dark power, and the Guatemalan government have only become stronger since former President Jimmy Morales ousted the UN-sponsored International Anti-Corruption Commission, known as the CICIG, in 2019. The press crackdown continues under the current administration of Alejandro Chamate, a frequent target of El Periódico's investigations. The paper reported on irregularities in the purchase of millions of dollars of COVID vaccines from Russia, on alleged bribes to the president from Russian businessmen operating controversial mines, and on the questionable role a favorite associate played in his administration. A la persona que estamos responsabilizando por todo lo sucedido con mi padre y con el periódico es el presidente Alejandro Yamatei. José Rubén Zamora's youngest son, Ramón, ran el periódico for some months while his father was imprisoned until he too was forced to leave the country for fear of legal prosecution. He spoke to Deutsche Villa Television. Eh, fue después de una serie de publicaciones, eh, investigaciones que hicieron sobre actos de corrupción we are holding President Alejandro Yamate responsible for everything that happened with my father in El Periódico. This followed publication of a series of reports investigating corruption in his government. Now joining us is another member of the Zamora family. José Rubén's eldest son, José Carlos, is also a journalist with Exile Content Studio. José Carlos Zamora, I can't even imagine what the last 11 months have been for your family. I only know that as an observer of Guatemala and Guatemalan journalism over the last two decades, that it seems that the Zamora family has paid 
a very, very high price for its commitment to the practice of independent investigative journalism. It's uh, it's been very sad. Uh, it's terrible for uh, for my father. It's been his life passion and mission, and uh, and uh, it's been terrible for the team, El Periódico, uh, when he was uh, arrested. Uh, was a team of uh, 166 people, 166 people who have been doing an extraordinary job and, and also who are devoted to the mission of, of journalism as public service. They have been doing rigorous uh, reporting and making sure Guatemalans have the, the information they need, important information they need to especially to hold the powerful and the government to account. So that part is, is very sad, but I think the, the the worst part and the highest price is for, for Guatemalans and Guatemala in general. It's really go, going backwards. It's uh, going into the dark ages. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's repression. And I think that's the really the, the worst part because of the lack of El Periódico. Uh, Guatemala feels uh, darker today. So the price is not just for your family, but the Guatemalans are also paying a high price because of the attack on journalism. They no longer have the consistent coverage that was produced for 26 years by El Periódico. And that coverage was significant. That coverage, I think, was incredibly important. I, I think uh, El, El Periódico like, played a, a really important role in, in, in Guatemala and, and in, in helping build a, a better country and strengthen democracy and and I do think there's there are great journalists in Guatemala and and people who are doing great a great job, but definitely it's a big loss. Uh, what I do think is positive is that I had never seen so much solidarity among journalists before. Uh, there's solidarity, there's collaboration, and and that's really wonderful to see. Just about. Every international press organization has issued a statement about the irregularities in this case, about the harm that it's doing to journalism in Guatemala and in the region. Yet these arguments seem to have fallen on deaf ears. How do you explain it? And would you have liked to have seen something even more in terms of an international action? taken about this case of your father's imprisonment i think the the support the the both locally from from all journalists uh, from civil society even though they are fearful uh, from the international community all the embassies uh, in different countries has uh, they have been very supportive uh, internationally there has been incredible support too, uh, and that that has been over, overwhelmingly positive. Uh, what I find uh, incredible is to see how shameless the Guatemalan government has become. Uh, not only are they cor corrupt and repressive, but they really have no shame. They have no shame, and they lie. They lie openly uh, when. Uh, President Yamatei, the few times that he has spoken about this and when he has been asked about if this is a, a persecution, a political persecution and an attack against freedom of the press, he always states that it, that's not what it is, that this is a criminal case and that everything that has been documented uh, against him in all of the investigations uh, are gossip including uh, articles by the AP and, and NPR and uh, Le Monde and New York Times. So 
there's been a lot of coverage, including like statements and sanctions by the U.S. Treasury. And he says everything is gossip. So given what you have just said, what are your realistic expectations regarding what the Guatemalan legal system has in store for your father? I'll just start by by restating that my father is innocent, uh, that uh, he has been held hostage by the state for uh, 312 days based on a fabricated case. And he has been subject to undergoing a spurious process that has been full of illegalities and is like a really textbook example of a, a violation of due process. Based on that illegal process, uh, you cannot expect anything else than a conviction. I've heard that despite terrible prison conditions and certainly an impact on his health, that his attitude remains strong. I think he's, uh, it's his life mission and passion and, and his convictions and principles what have allowed him to do what he has been doing for over 30 years. And he really sees this as a continuation of that work. Uh, I admire him deeply, not only as, a, as my father, he, he has been an incredible father, but also as a, a professional and a human being for exactly for that, like his convictions, his principles. Uh, he really stands up for what he believes in, no matter the consequences. And, and he's really faced a, a lot of different attacks over the years. And, and this has been a especially difficult situation, but he's, he's there. He published a, a post where he he says that Alejandro eh, Yamatei, eh, his partner, then the general attorney, Consuelo Porras, they think that they defeated him. And he says that they have really put him in, in a really bad situation, but that he's willing to, to face it, even though they think they have won. He has won. And... Guatemalans have won because this situation has exposed the corruption and the repression and the attacks on democracy and liberty and freedom of the press in Guatemala. Jose Carlos, thank you so much for your time during this difficult moment. Jose Carlos Zamora is Chief Communications and Impact Officer at Exile Content Studio. I remember a conversation with my grandfather. Close of the time he died, he told me, you must change your profession. I don't recommend you. Journalism is not a... His grandfather a was also a crusading the journalist who was forced into exile for more than a decade in the 1930s. Before he died, he warned his grandson. My times were, were, was better. They don't kill you. And now they kill you. But Zamora ignored his grandfather's pleas to abandon journalism. I think I am, I am going to, to die in my work. And I think it's too late to start again another thing. Of course, I am not going to have enough time and my power is too little. But I think, I think always that there is something that we can do using the newspaper that we can talk that instead of uh, use uh, guns, we can talk here, we can use the columns and everything. Award-winning veteran journalist Jose Ruben Zamora. Guatemalan prosecutors have asked for a 40-year sentence for the 66-year-old journalist. Here's one last note. Some of those interviewed for this report expressed frustration that the U.S. State Department hadn't done more to help in Zamora's release. They believe some in the Biden administration may be more concerned with Guatemala's role in keeping migrants from crossing north than in protecting freedom of speech in Central America. And this, they say, is short-sighted. 
given that people are leaving the region because they've lost hope for a better life, one that not only allows them opportunities to earn a living, but also the right to free expression and to live in a country where reporting on corruption isn't a crime. I'm Maria Martin reporting, and this is SOS Central America.